All right, let's talk about fluid volume deficit. Dehydration is when the fluid intake of the body is not enough to meet the needs of the body. Your goal for these patients with a fluid volume deficit is to restore their fluid volume, replace their electrolytes if it is indicated, and eliminate, treat, and prevent the cause of the fluid volume deficit. So there are three types of fluid volume deficits. You can have an isotonic dehydration, you can have a hypotonic dehydration, or a hypertonic dehydration. With isotonic dehydration, the water and the electrolytes are lost in the same proportion. This is also known as hypovolemia, and it is the most common type of dehydration. This causes a reduction in circulating blood volume. And what happens when we reduce the circulating blood volume? Well, we don't perfuse. The tissues are not perfusing and they're not getting their nutrients. In a hypertonic dehydration, water is lost more than the electrolytes. So fluid is gonna move from the intercellular compartment, so inside of the cell, out into the plasma or interstitial fluid space. This is gonna cause the cells to shrink. In a hypotonic dehydration, the patient is losing more electrolytes than they are losing water. So the fluid is gonna move from the interstitial space into the cell, causing the cells to swell. So some causes of fluid volume deficits. So in an isotonic dehydration, remember, we're losing fluids and electrolytes in the same proportion, it's usually caused by an inadequate intake of fluids and solutes. In a hypertonic dehydration, so this is a dehydration where water is lost more than the solutes. So anything that increases the fluid loss, like excessive perspiration, hyperventilation. Now with hyperventilation, remember we're losing fluids through insensible fluid loss. Also ketoacidosis, prolonged fevers, diarrhea. In a hypotonic dehydration, most of the time, it's from excessive fluid replacement. So this happens when we give our patient too much hypotonic fluids. What are we going to assess in our patients with a fluid volume deficit? So cardiovascular, first system. If we don't have enough volume, what do you think is gonna to happen to the pulse rate? So the pulse rate is going to increase to compensate for not having enough fluid. The fluid that's there must constantly be circulated to try to maintain perfusion. The pulse is gonna be weak and thready because there is no volume and there's gonna be a decrease in blood pressure because, again, no volume. We need volume to have a blood pressure. Remember, you're gonna assess flattened neck veins on your patient and diminish peripheral pulses. Respiratory status. These patients are gonna have an increased rate and depth of respirations because this is another way your body is going to compensate to get your oxygen and other nutrients circulating. So what's going to happen to the neurostatus of a patient with fluid volume deficit? Well, you can expect them to be a little lethargic and in severe cases, it can lead to coma. But the point is they're not gonna have energy at all. They're gonna be weak. What about the kidneys? So yeah, there's gonna be a decrease in urine output. And this happens for two reasons. One, because there is no volume to be excreted. And two, because we're not perfusing so it's not working to its full capacity. What about the skin? Do you think this patient's skin is gonna be dry or moist? Absolutely, it's gonna be dry. They're gonna have dry skin, poor skin turgor, dry mouth, dry mucous membranes. What are we gonna do for these patients? So like we mentioned before, these patients are gonna have weak and thready pulse. There's gonna be an increase in respiratory rate to compensate. So it's best to put them on a monitor, absolutely. We wanna also monitor their urine output. This is gonna tell us if we've given them enough fluids to get out of the fluid deficit once we start seeing an increase in their urine output. And of course, we're gonna give them fluids. Ideally, we wanna give them fluids by mouth. This is the best way to replenish patients with a fluid volume deficit. But if your patient is nauseous or vomiting, then we'll start an IV and give them the fluids through the IV instead. So go ahead and check out the All About Fluids lecture. It's going to talk about your isotonic fluids, your hypertonic fluids, and, and tell you which fluids fall under each category. So if the patient has a known cause like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, we give them anti-diarrheal medication. We give them antiemetics. If the patient has a high fever, we can give them antipyretics. 
and we want to monitor their electrolytes and treat any imbalance if it is present. So this is an example of a critical thinking question. The patient presents with dry mucous membranes, weak thready pulse, low urine output. This is your classic fluid volume deficit patient. What are some of your interventions? Well, you can prepare to give them anti-diarrheal and anti-nausea medications. You can prepare to start a central line. You can continue to monitor the patient, or you can assess mental status. So I know everybody wants to assess the mental status because assessment is the first thing that you do. Well, guess what? You can't spend all day assessing your patient. This question gives you everything you need to know about this patient. Dry mucous membranes, weak thready pulse, low urine output, you are automatically thinking fluid volume deficit. You don't need to look any further. The best answer for this question will be prepare to give anti-diarrheal and anti-nausea medication because we know based on the assessment that this patient is in a fluid volume deficit. And what are some causes of fluid volume deficits? Diarrhea and vomiting. And I didn't put to give fluids as an option because I know you know that these patients need fluids but I need you to think critically about what's happening. Read the question, figure out what's happening with the patient, and think about which option is going to be your best choice.